myself for far too long. Goodbye. After many a request and many a month, my computer is repaired, my mood is strong, and I think it's finally time to tackle Beyond the Dark Portal. First off, I have to throw out a sincere thank you again to all the fans and comments and people in the chat for these streams. Real life is a giant strategy game, and not a very great one at that, so the most valuable resource we have is time. You guys are taking your time to hang out with me, so that's great. And at the very least, I will try and take my time to read all of your comments and chats as best as I can. Don't feel bad if I don't respond. In case you have forgotten... I, I'm kind of retarded. <laughs> I'm the guy who reads a text message and immediately forgets or thinks I responded and then two months go by and I'm like, oh shit. Legit, I tried to read them all and I've seen some really nice comments in the chat that I missed, so you are cherished and you are seen. I am hyper gamer mode when doing these challenges, so I might miss you. A lot of interesting conversations in the chat, so anyways, thank you. I'm going to go off script here. Being an adult, like I said, is bullshit. After deploying twice with the military... Being in the normal circumstances, you can kind of feel hollow or empty at times. You're surrounded by loved ones and friends and you're not out there risking your life anymore, but there's something weird going off in my brain. Something that makes me sad. I don't miss it, but at the same time, it gets hard. But having these streams and the awesome community that's building, it's, it's really nice. It gives me that boost of energy that you need, that... I think attractive people seem to get every day, so that's pretty cool. Anyways, thanks again. Beyond the Dark Portal is the expansion to Tides of Darkness. Remember expansions? Battle chests? No, 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 not battle passes, battle chests. When a game that didn't quite live up to the developer's standard, they released an expansion which for a lot of games was almost a whole new game in and of itself. Beyond the Dark Portal is just that. An entire new campaign set in our favorite fantasy realm and more. 12 new missions for each race, a brand new tile set, and heroes with their own voices and faces. And that's it. Unfortunately, heroes don't get different sprites, which would be awesome. And there was no new units. But this was the 90s, I'll give it a pass. Honestly, it is a little disappointing, but this was early on for an expansion. Look at Brood War. It added multiple new units, new campaigns, new characters, actors, cinematics, balancing, and features. And Warcraft got dirt and mushrooms. Heroes don't appear in skirmish or multiplayer, so it's basically just a way to play some more single-player missions. I still think it's a better deal than the $30 horse armor for a $60 game that needs to be online at all times, but call me old-fashioned grandpa. Beyond the Dark Portal is a lot harder than Tides of Darkness, but there is a lot of tricks and cheese you can do to get the upper hand. The AI wasn't great in the vanilla, so the expansion, they get a lot more aggressive and a little more intelligent. But that doesn't mean it can't break. And break it does. Okay, we definitely need to address the elephant in the room here for some people. I can already see you all smashing those keyboards in the comment section. So let's talk about saving and loading. An innocuous subject, no? Well, I didn't know this coming in, but apparently saving and loading can massively fuck with the AI. Either breaking it entirely putting it to sleep for a bit, or making it train only one type of unit. Shoutouts to creator Redwings, who, by the way, check out his channel. He does some great Warcraft stuff. Redwings and a couple other Giga Chads in chat shared their experiences. While it isn't definite, calculable, or predictable, saving and loading can definitely change the game. However, it is so hard to really see what happens. Sometimes, yes, it looks like the AI goes passive, but then without saving or loading, they just wake up. Sometimes, even without saving and loading, the AI can still break. There are some tactics to help this. Building in certain areas can cause Death Knights to get stuck, so even with no saving and loading, and I have experimented, sometimes the AI still acts up. So what do we do? I know the purists out there will say this invalidates the run, but I am simply playing the game as I bought it, unaltered, out of the box. I'm not purposely starting each mission and saving and loading a thousand times to break the AI, and I only save and load when necessary. So I decided to make a compromise. This run is extremely tedious without saving and loading, so I decided I will save the game, but if I need to reload, I will restart the mission and then load. Starting with the Orc campaign. This should reset the AI if it breaks, and one save and load still has a chance to do nothing to the AI. This I think is fair. And if it's early enough in the mission, I will just restart. 
This will make my mental health a problem, but it should hopefully make things as pure as you can. This doesn't make the game a cakewalk though, it simply slows down the AI aggression from what we can see. It seems to make them forget to chop lumber, but forcing them to repair constantly can also re-trigger them to cut wood, so I'm at a loss with what to appease everyone. This run is just for entertainment anyways, not for some record or trophy, just to bring some Warcraft content into the world. And yes, I play at the default speed, with Fog of War off. Why? It's just how I play the game. It's how I played as a kid, it's how I play now, it's just the most comfortable for me. Fog of War is a legit option in the menu too, so it's not like I'm cheating using the code to eliminate the Fog of War. Anyways, just don't want to piss anybody off. I save and load my games. It was 30 hours to beat this run without saving. God fucking help me if I can sit here and do a full reset when Carl the Dingus dies at three and a half hours into a level. Hopefully you guys understand and give me some slack. I suggest you don't worry about this sort of thing and just enjoy yourself. That goes for you all too. Yes. The levels in this game are pretty big. You're always outnumbered and the enemy loves spamming magic and dragons. Oh my God. You will hate dragons and griffins after playing this campaign. Almost every single mission has these assholes just sneaking around and blowing your shit up. Destiny. Let blood rain from There's even a dragon boss. Heroes are also pretty good in this game too. Unfortunately, this is before the Altar of Kings, so if your hero dies, you are donezo. If I can give one piece of advice to people wanting to beat this campaign in any way, it would be this. The best defense is a good offense. What do I mean by this? Well, like in Tides of Darkness, the game often gives you enough starting forces to beat one or more players right from the start, which drastically makes things easier. I was pretty proud of some of these strategies I employed here. Hopefully it impresses you. So without any more dilly-dallying, let's answer. Can you beat Warcraft 2 Beyond the Dark Portal? Deathless. Rules? Same as usual, beat every mission without losing a unit. That includes summons and sappers. The scoreboard doesn't have units lost, but enemies killed is a good way to know. With a big asterisk. Level 1. Alaria's Journey. So what has happened? Well, the humans destroyed the Dark Portal and are cleaning up any remaining orcs still in Azeroth. But something is amiss. This mission is our intro to the heroes. You have to travel through the countryside gathering all the heroes to make for a new Stormwind. Alaria is our first hero, and man, she is a boss. She is probably the most valuable hero functionality-wise, besides maybe Deathwing. She has more range in the guard tower, as much damage as a cannon tower, and does piercing. And she looks good in red. This mission is fairly straightforward, and is just a point A to point B. There are two catapults and a Death Knight to worry about here, so just cat and mouse them into your firing line. Danath is outside a little cottage here and is quite the artist. His favorite pastime is Draw Steel, boys. He is just a big old tank, so will come in handy later. Terralian is across the river. This is one of two missions that experiment with peasants that can only build certain things. Like in this mission, they essentially can only chop lumber to make you a transport. Get a transport and go rescue Terralian. This guy was my favorite hero. He's just a cool, stoic paladin, and he gets to clap hilarious cheeks. The Giga Chad. Use Exorcism and Alaria to snipe these towers and skelly boys and bring them to the circle of power. I didn't know this until chat mentioned, but apparently you don't need to rescue the heroes. You just need to touch the circle of power with three red units. So the peasants and ballista you rescue would still work. That's kind of neat. Level 2. The Battle for Nethergard. The humans have built a fortress around the ruins of the Dark Portal and called it Nethergard, which is pretty badass. But from the rift, a massive force of orcs suddenly appear. This is one of many jerk starts to this campaign, which has to be the main point. The hardest parts of this campaign are almost always the very start. This game likes to start you off immediately under fire, and this mission is the first example. It begins after the fortress has fallen, and you have a barracks, a couple towers, and Carl the Footman, and woo, boom. This guy starts with two flaming boulders already en route. This is tricky, because depending on where you try to move him, he might not even follow your orders. I find moving him right works nice, and you can squeak him out. Reminds me of the Lothar mission. About this time, Red sends a couple ogres to taste your steel. But luckily, Danath draws steel. Now this level gives you a good open space for the healthy gold mine to get your base started, but I'm feeling spicy today. 
Like I said before, this game expects you to build up and fight an overwhelming enemy, the theme being you're basically an expedition for soon to be on the enemy's home turf. Remember, the best defense is a good offense. First though, I gotta get Carl out, and two cannon tires bar his way, but he has been running his fitness tests. And where I passed but puked, Carl will make it through. <coughs> ouch, 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 ouch. Extinguish me! The gang is back together. I decide to head north. You fight three enemies here. Warsong to the north, who goes infantry. Shadow Moon in the old fortress, which actually remains somewhat passive, but attacks with death knights often. And then Laughing Skull, who sends some ground, but mostly dragons. Big yellow dick dragons. I think I have a strong enough starting force to knock out the Warsong right away. I have a ballista, Danath a super tank, and some other forces. And the enemy doesn't actually start with all that much. The biggest threats in these early bases are their towers. Lure out catapults and snipe their towers. The enemy AI in this campaign are also hyper vigilant when putting out fires. You can guarantee that a caravan with peons will show up to repair. You can use this to your advantage later on. Their vigilance will be their downfall. A couple resets and we finally have taken the base. Nice. Just in time for fucking dickheads. Archers legally counter dragons, but a dragon can kill an archer in two, sometimes three shots, so you need to be careful. From here, I scout the map and see that yellow is actually quite vulnerable in the back. I send a hit squad of archers and a ballista, and eventually a Carl to flank around and set up a fob, or forward operating base for you non-military folks. While doing this, just build up at home and be careful when the death knights come to tickle your towers. Once my hit squad is here, I poorly time an attack and get a dragon who can outshoot my weak archers, so I pull back, build up a couple of towers for defense. I finally strike out and clean out the Laughing Skull, and by now Black's gold mine is gone, so he starts to trying to expand where my base should have been. This is most commonly known as the Peon Conga Line. I try a cannon tower across the river, but the Death Knight shut that shit down. But I try to tower out their Great Hall, and a Death Knight intercepts Carl, and boom. I'm going to toot my own horn here and say that was pretty slick. I've learned a couple tactics from watching those Warcraft 2 matches online. Black actually doesn't do too much here overall, even without the save and load glitch, so I get ready to unleash my new tactic I learned. Okay, it's quiz time! Who has a beard and cannot group cast spells? That's right, dwarf sappers! Confused? Let's science this for a bit. Warcraft Micro is hard. In fact, you couldn't even A-move until the Battle.net edition. Bloodlust and mass healing are tedious tasks of clicking, casting, clicking, casting, clicking, casting. But what if I told you there was a better way? You can group cast in this game. Yes, I know. Let's go over it. You have your control group of units. Maybe all mages, maybe some mages and archers. And you want to cast all the blizzards you can. With your control group ready, say control group 1. Select the mage and select the spell you want to cast. Now, hit Alt 1, or whatever the control group was, and now you will see your group is selected, but the target reticle is still ready. Now blast them! Blow your mind? Because mine sure was. It really makes mass heals, mass blizzards, mass exorcisms just so good. It really makes things a million times easier. Usually only effective for area of effect spells. Use your new tactic and blow up the remainder of the enemy and secure the fortress. Two missions done. Shout out to user Andokai Kamaris for telling me this secret. Level 3, once more unto the breach. This map looks familiar. We are back to the dark portal and it looks like the enemy recolonized. We need to secure it again. Terralian's turn this time. You start with a tiny fort and have to fight three enemies, two of which are safe by sea. Right away, move north. There is a tiny enemy outpost here with an altar of storms. Burn this down so it slows the enemy's bloodlust. Next, turn your attention to orange. These guys start slow, but build up quick. While this happens, the enemy will start landing strike teams on your continent and attacking you with, you guessed it, dragons. I set up a wall of my own and start sniping cannon towers, luring enemies and moving in to destroy OJ. While this is happening, I like to spam random guard towers about so while the enemy dragon AI is so erratic, they will seemingly randomly pop into your base in the most sneaky way, so intercepting them with random towers definitely helps and slows them down. Avoid ships here. The enemy has too many ships and submarines and towers of their own, and they will just get assassinated. 
Instead, freeze them. Mages are pretty OP, and their blizzard is crucial to my success in this run. That and griffins. Griffins are usually clunky idiots, but they can really mess with the AI. Picking away at outlying buildings and the enemy will conga line peons to spam repairs and use up valuable resources. You can also kill peons with a splash or targeting them in order to waste up more of their resources. Eventually, they will run out of one or the other. When you can, blizzard the other key structures and units. Like in War 1, there is usually an aggro range threshold that will send most enemies to your location, so with the new blizzard tactics, we have the ability to wipe out enemy armies in one fell swoop. Once red is dead, turn your attention to purple and the dark portal island in the middle. Death Knights are the name of the game here and these guys have a serious hate boner for you. They will spam cyclones at passing air or ships and death coils which almost always insta-kills when it hits. I always forget about subs and subs are a major pain here and sink my transports and I keep forgetting that they are there. I try to get a little crafty with these Death Knights by invisibility my mages but apparently once the death coil is ordered <laughs> you are getting your meal. I forgot that you only actually have to destroy all the enemy strongholds and fortresses, so I've been working way too hard. Blizzard the rest of the bases and bring Turalyon to the portal. We now move on to a brand new world, never to return. Level 4, Beyond the Dark Portal. Roll credits! We have landed in a strange, muddy place with mushrooms for trees. And it's another panic station start. You are immediately attacked by a small orc squad and are tasked with killing everything. Three enemies, Shattered Hand to the south, Warsong to the west, and more Shadow Moon to the north. Get moving quickly, white is the obvious choice here. Warsong has a tower barricade to the west, so you can't break them. Once white's base is secure, you actually have enough men to take out red too. Skirt around these trees and snipe the towers if you can. They will probably spawn grunts or trolls to mess with you, but you should be fine. Black likes dragons here and will send a few your way, so I build a wall of towers with some outliers to intercept. Once you have your mages and some exorcism, start luring and blasting the enemy guards. Once the towers and personnel are dead, mop up. There are some random ass laughing skull skelly boys scattered around, so clean them up as well. This is a pretty straightforward mission. Level 5, Upon the Shadowed Seas. These got some cool names for chapters in this. This is a fun one. You need to build a naval infrastructure center in order to combat the Horde Navy better. To do this, we need to destroy four enemies. Bone Chewers directly south, which is the intended starting base, and then some Bleeding Hollow to the east. Laughing Skull and Thunderlords on their islands to the south. These Navy levels are the best example of cheesing the AI. They are truly awful at gathering oil and lumber efficiently, but we will get to this later. The first thing we need to do is go against the intention of the game and yet again rush orange. They start small but get big, so we go straight away and knock them out. Now we just need to avoid making ships until we absolutely need them. For now, brace for yellow's landing parties. They will send them often and they get bigger and bigger. I like to wall myself in after a couple mishaps. The AI impresses me here. Every time I load, they land on a different location and avoid my towers. Once I am fully sealed in with buildings, I can tech up. Once I get my castle with mages, I discover that you can't make griffins on this map. Clever, clever devs. Griffins are solid counter to juggernauts and cannon towers, which the enemy has a lot of. I move as far northeast as I can and start my transports. Yellow has an island to the far southeast and is fairly undefended for the most part. He is designed for aggression more so than defense, so I land on this upper portion and claim the island for my own. You don't need to worry about expanding since you got four gold mines on your starting continent, but might as well make up a mage tower here and blizzard purple's base if I can. Purple being an island typically will run out of wood right away. In fact, it might be a sound strategy to rush his lumber operation right away and to cut it off. His trees are on a separate island without a great hall, so he cannot remake his peons. Most enemy naval players tend to get their fleets stuck. The AI likes to hug their main buildings with their standing armies like their halls or their shipyards, so they will often lock out their own tankers. This one, unfortunately, isn't dumb enough yet, so we need to be safe. Snipe what you can with ballistas and mages and avoid the juggernauts. I try to move a mage into range on the south island and get decoiled instantly. The enemy death knights are the biggest threat save for dragons. I build some ships on my own and finally work on multiple fronts to take him out. Once his towers are down, you can get in and mop up the rest.
Level 6, The Fall of Akundun. This was always a really hard mission as a kid, and I was nervous about attempting it myself, Deathless. You start with an expedition force, some ships and transports, and Terry and Danath. Now, this is actually probably one of the best designed missions for open strategy here. To the west is a bone chewer base, which focuses on navy and landing forces. To the southeast is a warsong base, which is tucked inside some cliffs and trees. To the southwest is our objective, kill the bleeding hollow, orange. These orcs share an extended base with a massive shadow moon mountain fortress. You have the option to either take out teal and build up there, or take out red and build there. Either way, OJ and Black will build up and attack you with dragons and ships, so it's up to you with what to do. I love this. It makes you think outside the box. You have a decent array of forces, and often in deathless runs, I dislike when you start with ships because they are easily forgotten about or assassinated by submarines, and here it's perfect. My moist brain sparks with an idea though. Why attack red or teal? Sit around and wait for the flaming death from the sky when you can attack OJ directly. Our enemy was thrusting deeply into the motherland's tender nether regions. I scout out and see that OJ has really small starting naval defense, so I make my decision and go for it. I knock out his ships and try sniping a couple of towers. Once they are down, I move my landing forces in, leaving the peasants behind. I don't want them getting caught up in the crossfire. Using Ballista and my heroes as tanks, I manage to whittle down OJ and then go for the kill. I kill all their peons and boom, their base is destroyed. This is awesome. I never thought to attack first and it worked. With OJ dead, it's time to head home. I send Dan and Terry home to touch the circle of power and uh, hmm. The end isn't triggering and uh, what the fuck? Teal landed some troops in OJ's smoldering ruins and kills my men? Damn it. Let's see here what I did miss. And oh my god. OJ had a lumber mill down here the whole time. Reload and blow up the mill. And now it's time to... What? Carl squad under attack. No! This is what I love about this. Teal landed on the beach to kill my weak force this time. But when I reloaded, they decided to attack my defenseless peasants to the north. How did they know they were up here, though? That's, what, that's what's beyond me. But it, shit, I gotta pay more attention. He also sends a ship or two to pester my fleet, but here we go. Okay, OJ is dead. Everyone is alive, and we're headed home. Just gotta take care of one more sneaky catapult, and moving on. Level 7, Deathwing. This is probably the most unique mission in all of Warcraft 2. This is the closest thing to a World of Warcraft RPG-ish type level you will get. We need to kill the Big Daddy Dragon. Deathwing, who comes back for his own expansion in WoW, or it's a different Deathwing? I don't know WoW lore, so I assume it's a Redcon. We start with two heavy hitters, Alaria and Khadgar, and a submarine, probably the only submarine we'll ever see me make. I move and rescue this team of peasants and archers and a random sapper. This campaign sprinkles these buggers in a lot of starting forces and they always go hiding in the corner of my base. Here's the tricky bit though, you don't actually have a full tech tree here. In fact, you have barely anything. The only thing you can build are shipyards, destroyers, and a lumber mill. You can't even make transports, so keep yours safe. So what's the skinny here? White has a naval base to the northwest, Red has a big base to the north, and Deathwing's roost is high in the mountains. Kind of funny how you can tell they wanted you to fight Deathwing on top this giant mountain like Smaug and the Hobbit, but they didn't have the graphics to display it. Instead, you just need to fly across this giant plateau to get him. All the enemies here in this map are extremely passive, except for Black. Deathwing will send dragons at you with a high rate, but there is a tactic here. Since the AI follows the rules of the game, that means they need 1. Gold to make dragons, and 2. Farms for population. I went into the map editor, and it looks like Black starts with 34k gold, which can fund around 13 dragons, and they fly erratically around the map, so instead of sending out my heroes to get caught mid-journey, I decided to chill, and with the help of chat, count the dragons that get sniped. Alaria murders dragons, and Khadgar, being a mage, has great resources to kill them too. Slow is a massively underrated spell, especially on dragons, who have awful reaction time and target switching. You can often nullify a dragon outright with your archers and pick away. You can even cast slow on ships, which I always forget to do. Or you can just polymorph. It is a really good counter, but it's 200 mana, so it's kind of a one and done for a while. Having just Khadgar makes this spell a little dangerous. 
You do have some paladins here too, which is prime. These guys, especially on what is essentially a no-build missions, makes things a lot easier. After about 20 minutes or so, it seems that Deathwing has run out of kids. Time to make my move. White has only a juggernaut and a couple destroyers, but they do have submarines. I put Alaria on this little island with Khadgar and start peppering their ships. This one turtle thinks he can escape, but Giga Chad Alaria snipes it. Imagine killing a giant turtle with a bow and arrow. With that, I land on the shore and pick off the enemies, mostly skeletons. Nothing too scary. Rescue the prisoners in this cage and bring them south. Don't venture too close to Red. They have one death knight here that could spell your doom. Interestingly, black farms are also in Red's base, so if you get to the base early on, you can destroy these and black will be starving and no more dragons. You'd have to get here really quickly though. With the help of Blizzard and Exorcism, I nail these skelly boys and rescue our next hero, Kurdren and Skyri. This pair is quite good, not as strong as Deathwing, but when you get him, he is really handy later on. Set up your lines. It is time to engage the big bad. Let Khadgar recharge his mana. Heals are ready. Archers are spread out to avoid splash. Deathwing can potentially one-shot your archers, so make sure you use Kurdren to soak the hits. Once Deathwing is aggroed, lure him back to your firing line. Cast slow, blizzard, and hammer him until he goes down. A good strat too is to lure him south instead of north, and you'll have made a fleet of destroyers, which are strong anti-air vessels, and blast them there. I didn't want to risk losing a ship though, so I just did it vanilla. With that, blow up his house, and that spells the end of Deathwing. Level 8, the Coast of Bones. This is one of the levels I was most worried about, a naval mission. Typically, I enjoy these, but the game starts you with a small army, no ballista, and some ships. This is the annoying part. It is hard to start a navy in this game without getting picked off by enemies whose navies are already established. Taking a base and starting will be a challenge in and of itself, but protecting your vulnerable ships while you tech up will be a pain. Usually you head west and take out White's base and claim it as your own, but they have three towers here and a very narrow attack path. I build a bunch of farms on my starting spit of land to get ahead in food while I build a colony hoping the enemy will ignore this island. I try to attack west instead, but cannot break this with my starting force. Luckily, this island has an expansion mine right next to it, so I take it and share the island with white for now. You have two enemies other than white. Yellow, who trains ships and landing parties, and purple, who just makes ships. They don't have a foundry, and I don't think they ever build one, so you don't have to worry about transports or juggernauts. Yellow, however, sends really nasty landing parties that will be a major pain. After I land, I start building and walling off, and I move my ships to the southeastern corner, hoping the enemy won't notice them there. With that, I actually start to get attacked by white. Small forces, nothing a couple towers and plugging the holes with knights can't handle. Casually, I have been able to take purple's base and use it as my own in the start, and white actually builds up quite a bit, but this will have to suffice. Also, don't mind Carl. You don't have a lot of room, so he's inspecting the back of this blacksmith. Luckily, my entrance is in range of one of their towers, so I snipe the tower with a ballista. And remember those farms I thought would be safe? Yep. Yeah. The enemy sniffed them out. Clever girl. I think I'm confident enough to finally take on white, and you remember those ships I put in the corner thinking they would be safe? Yep. Yeah. Clever girl again. They landed a lusted ogre on my island during the raid on white. There is saving grace here. The enemy AI in this game, like I mentioned before, doesn't do well with ships and hang out, especially in coves like the yellow base. They almost always eventually get stuck hoarding all their ships and subs in the harbor, getting blocked and bumping into each other until they eventually run out of oil. What the fuck are we doing out here, guys? There's like a thousand of us. Who called a thousand of us? Yellow is really pissing me off here. They have started their D-Day invasion and keep landing forces and sending juggernauts to my fleet. Nowhere is safe. My best bet here is to stall them until they run out of oil. Luckily, they only send one at a time, so I can micro my ships to pick them off. Unfortunately, they land a clutch catapult with a troll body blocker and snipe my peasants. I let them knock my tower out and get some action, and Purple sends one of their destroyers to pick at me. The island is safe. Joe the archer is pissed that his tower went down, and now I need to do something to Yellow. It looks like Yellow is stuck in his cove, but he has two outer shipyards. 
I sent some ballistas on this island to snipe one, but I might have gotten lucky and his oil ran out. His lumber might have run out too. While their oil is gone, I killed her transport. Can't make any more if there's no oil. This is strategy gaming at its peak. Looks like purple is stuck too, which is handy, but while I'm building up my mages, a new surprise hits me. Dragons. I have never seen purple go this long in this level. I have no idea he eventually makes dragons, and man, it was not a good time for this. These dragons put a massive wrench in my plans, but luckily they don't send too many, just a steady stream of one at a time in this particular spot in my base. With yellow starved resources, purple blockaded by themselves, it's time to start grinding them down with ice. I try to establish a colony on Purple's Island and blizzard their lumber line. Yellow really wants to build a shipyard here, so I park my Griffos here and keep them in check. They will waste so much money just rebuilding and dying, rebuilding and dying. Ironically, I myself run out of money here, and I can't help but wonder where all the money went. Just upgrades and mages eat into your reserve. Now it's simply a matter of time and slowly grinding away at the enemy. Pop in, launch the mother of all blizzards, pop out, repeat. The rest of this mission is cleanup. Purple dies, move on to yellow. It's really satisfying blowing up this fleet and unclogging their shipyards. Feels like unclogging a sink and watching the buildup wash away. Once yellow goes down, that's the end of the mission. One of the hardest ones, done. Level 9, The Heart of Evil. This is a thematic level. We need to destroy Terran Gorfeed, one of the coolest heroes, and his inner sanctum of evil. Flaming runestones, altars of storms, and demons all over. This mission intends for you to build a town at this first gold mine, but I take the fight to the enemy. There is a prison with a ballista north of the teal base, and you can capture and use them to snipe towers and key targets. With this, you can claim the bone chewers with their own walls as your own. This will be a dragon grind, so I spam towers everywhere. I build up what I can and scout the enemy. So this is probably a prime example of the save and load glitch in effect, at least for red. They typically are the ones to spam dragons at you. So I went back and played casually to see if it was that much harder and I was shocked to discover that it doesn't really change much. The only differences are red builds a squad and hugs their town hall and sends dragons. Black death and decays one of my towers but then gets stuck on the cliff. That's it. Neither three of the enemy players attack me and I left my game going for about 20 minutes or so to see. They legit just build up an army and just camp at their bases. So I feel a little better about the glitch taking an effect, and who knows, they might wake themselves up at some point anyways. Same strats, but I decided to make a squad of rangers and pallies since exorcism will be handy here. I use griffins to bully red and knock out their dragon roost. White is a simple lure and chill. We need to be careful with Shadow Moon. They have death knights, a pile of blood ogres, and red seems to have woken up on its own. Black's economy is actually situated on the left and is super exposed, so you can starve them out here. From their economy, you can funnel and freeze them. Terran doesn't seem to have any spells other than Death Coil, so group up some paladins and use your mass spell technique to nuke his ass into obscurity until World of Warcraft comes out. Once all the troops and towers are dead, finish off the runestones and raise the rest of the inner sanctum. Now we're on to the end game. Level 10, The Siege of Vanguard. Well, well, this is probably the hardest mission in the game, or at least the most anticipated Deathless. You have to hold out against besieging Shattered Hand, Bone Chewer, and Thunderlords. This mission is relentless, and you will be constantly attacked until the enemy runs out of resources. It is also an under-attack start. The enemy is already at the gates. You start in a huge fortress, though, with multiple layers and towers, and you get all the heroes at your disposal. Immediately pull back your gate guards and jump straight into the lumber line. Your peasants are already under attack up here, too. A couple tries, but it actually is quite possible if you're quick enough. I suppose you could lower the game speed all the way in order to help, but my speed was just perfect for it. I have a really wild strategy here that I wanted to try, and was hoping it would be viable. You have a lot of people that cannot die, but if there's no one for the enemy to kill, no one can die, right? Two of your enemies, white and teal, will spam your front wall, while purple is actually on an island to the north and will be passive for a while before spamming the good old dragons at you. With Kurjan, you can strike at Purple's farms or towers, forcing them to repair and waste peons. Do this well enough, and you can disable the player altogether. But what if Kurjan wasn't alone? I start harvesting lightly, I do not want to commit too many workers. 
I decide to exodus, and like Moses, I need to cross the Great Sea. I build transports and group up my refugees, but the goddamn bone chewers catch me and send attack waves my way. It looks as though they are focused on my heroes. Where they are, and they attack. I lose a footman here, because obviously the weakest footman in my army decides to Leroy Jenkins to his death. I try again and evacuate my military troops to the island. Luckily, since the purple player is a dragon trainer, his gold mine is quite potent. I leave some peasants to work while I destroy purple, but the moment my walls are tested again, I bail. I'm happy to leave my fortress to its fate and leave it quiet. I start setting up on Purple's Island and scout out. It looks like the enemies have slowed down considerably. I thought their AI broke at first, but they are still building buildings and teching up. White even gets Death Knights. I have a theory that since the enemy are focused on the direction of your heroes, since there are none on the mainland, the enemy doesn't exactly know what to do and decide to just, uh, chill? I played this level casually without saving and loading as well to experiment and it had similar results. The enemy sent a few catapults and ogres towards my castle, but once the outer layers of walls fell, they kindly just took a break. This is why this glitch is so annoying. It seems to have different quirks with every time it happens, or it doesn't happen. Either way, I get my mages and an airstrike team. Amazingly, there is an oil patch in this map, so I get one tanker to give her just in case I need more naval support. Teal and White both have an affinity for this gold mine in between them, so a well-placed griffin and some towers of your own, and you can force a peon conga line genocide, which drastically hampers the enemy economy. Teal has a big patch of land above their tree line, so I start a colony here. Mage tower, barracks, and some guard towers, and I blizzard the enemy town. They aggro towards the trees and get absolutely mowed down. This is satisfying. Alaria stupidly decides to leave the base to take on the catapult, so you gotta keep her real in. Terralian's got a feisty lady on his hands. Once Teal goes down, it is a matter of similarly cleaning up White. Be careful of his death knights though, they can force a reset super fast. Cadgar and his mage squad blast away at the Shattered Hand and secure the win. This was a cool one. I am really stoked my strategy of mass migration worked. It's possible the AI broke, but they did continue sending attack waves, so maybe I'll try this again without saving and loading. Level 11, Dance of the Laughing Skull. A really cool mission. You may have noticed that an orc voice narrates the objectives. It looks like the yellow Laughing Skull orcs are not over fond of Ner'zhul and his lackeys, so decide to help you defeat him. We need to take control of an orc base in the north and defeat some bone chewers and some thunderlords in the area. This mission is cool because you get to play with orcs, but you have a few paladins for heals and heroes. The best of both worlds. And you get to play as blue orcs, too. Mm, nah, I'm not going to do this. You see, they made the mistake of giving you some of the best heroes in your arsenal. You start with every resource you need to do a lot of damage. Alaria for ranged DPS, Cadgar for crowd control, and Terralian and Pallies for heals and tank. I like to rush purple here, even after capturing the base. They take up the Death Knights and Blood Ogres and get real nasty. I had a crazy idea though. Could I beat purple before capturing the base? Let's see. The biggest threat here is cannon towers. Cadgar is good, but he is alone and so has to rest between blizzards. And Alaria has the same range as a cannon tower. You can sort of micro the tower by rubber banding Alaria in and out, but I miss the timing and get punted. After a Hail Mary that failed, I decided to try my luck with Terry. See, Terry is a beefy boy. I move him in first and both cannon towers focus him. Since he is melee distance, one of the towers cannot actually hit him, so I power down these towers. Once they are down, Purple actually doesn't have much else in his base. Kill his peons and blow up his two barracks and bingo, Purple is dead. So then, I had a crazier idea. Could I kill Green too? I was then challenged by one of my viewers to not build a building, so I said, well, I'll do you one better. What if I don't even touch my buildings? We are to the south of Teal, and they mostly make grunts, trolls, and catapults. I do some luring with Terry and murdering with Ali and Caddy. Khadgar is actually not a bad hero. He's got solid range, more damage than a knight, it's just he doesn't auto-target enemies, which makes them a little weak. The enemy has mostly guard towers here too, so that means Ali can outrange them. Be careful of all the catapults Teal spams though. Just back up and isolate with Terry. Once the towers are down, go fucking nuts. The enemy base is ripe for the picking and they have a tower and a handful of warriors to the east. 
Once the buildings go down, they aggro in your direction. Slay them and head back to the Thunderlord. Blow up to the rest of the buildings and boom, that's it. We just beat the second last mission, not only without dying, without building, or even having a base. This was just a fun one. I rush purple casually, but I always rescue the base first. Never thought I could beat it alone. Just proves how good the heroes are if you use them right. After all the craziness and themes of the last couple missions, this one was fairly low-key and a small map too. But it's a really cool idea mixing things up and playing with orcs as humans. Level 12. The Bitter Taste of Victory. This is it. The finale. Ner'zhul is attempting to open dozens of portals to escape Draenor, but they're tearing the planet apart. We need to stop this by destroying the portal once and for all. This is another onslaught siege mission. You start with a giant fortress that is under attack right away, and we need to fall back to our inner keep and launch a strike from there. We have all the heroes here, and their lives are forfeit, except for Khadgar. So you can sacrifice them at will. Except we are deathless, so we won't be doing this. Pull your starting force back. This takes a couple tries. You have around three groups of sentries to save, and the reaction time needs to be quick. After a few tries, I eventually get my boys back behind the lines. My plan here is to knock out White as soon as you can. They are your biggest threat. White actually starts inside your walls, which is wild. Who was watching this gateway that an orc incursion was able to build a small town inside my walls? Black is in the corner, and they will kind of chill back on the ground forces for a while, but will spam dragons at you. Red, we will get to. I tried to attack White a little too early and can't quite break them. They have some clutch tower locations, and the one below their hall is what's getting me all screwed up. I need a mage support. But oh yes, we have heroes, and they can be helped. Let's take a look at them. And... Well, 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 well. Looks like I've been bamboozled again. A rock wall separates your heroes from you, and they give you a sapper. Wow! I'm getting fucking flashbacks here. Oh, why? Why, oh why, does Blizzard insist on trapping people behind cliff walls with a convenient sapper to save the day? It is like they needed to justify this unit because nobody uses them. They are expensive, they take forever to train, and they are fragile. I've seen their uses in multiplayer matches occasionally, but like a Blizzard or Ballista does their job way better. Uh, so I guess that's it. You cannot beat this game without... Hold on. Upon scouting this map out, I didn't expect to see the promised land. And by land, I mean sea. Is this destiny? Is this a sign that the sailor doing this challenge run is saved by the very thing he hates? The sea? To the direct right of your heroes is a body of water, and this game gives you enough oil for one castle, one foundry, and one transport. It is prime solution. I wonder if they knew this. So I have a solution to this long problem. I still need to deal with White though. Kurgeon obviously can fly, so I bring him down avoiding the evading forks and start bombing White's farms. Once your outer wall falls, prepare for a big tidal wave of green. The green tide, if you will. You start with a mage, but you should probably train another fast. Blizzard the outside of your walls on the incoming horde. They should go down fairly easily. Once the first onslaught is wiped, I realize that White has sent their peons to repair Kurdrin's damage, so he gets to start blasting them too. White doesn't start with much resources or buildings, but if you leave him alone, he will grow to a big scale and be a major pain in the ass. Apparently in the code, Korgeth and Dentarg are supposed to be here guarding the portal, but the developers forgot to give them a start location, so they don't appear. I bring a small commando squad of mages and knights and kill his peons and blizzard their towers. That, combined with Kurdrin, means the White has been fully disabled. He cannot afford any more peons, and I'm out of range of the rest of the tower, so I pick away here while setting up my defenses. So let's talk about Red here for a second. Red can be dangerous. In fact, he's actually a lot more dangerous than Black, but he is actually tied to the very rock wall that is bricking my heroes right now. He builds a basic set of units, but will not attack until the rock wall is opened. Luckily for me, that wall ain't never getting opened, so red is a non-issue. Black will attack you with dragons often, so I make a wall of towers and keep mages nearby. Polymorph is awesome here and insta-kills dragons, turning them into harmless pigs. Harmless pigs indeed. 
Things are going okay. Base is built, upgrades bought, but I decide to check and see if I've lost a unit yet just to make things, so I do a quick surrender. What the fuck? No. No shit, man, I was doing so well. When did the enemy get a kill? Thank goodness I checked now, I would have lost my goddamn mind if I beat the mission to see a death like in Warcraft 1. But who fucking died? Well, it seems that history is doomed to repeat itself. If you saw my first Deathless Run video, you might remember there being a pesky little piece of mutton that robbed me of my perfect zero enemy kill score. Well, it seems the sheep had a cousin, Chris P. Bacon, the demon pig. You see, Polymorph turns enemies into critters, in this case, a hell boar, and this dragon turned into a really juicy morsel. This pig started to wander and decided to go to the church to repent his future sins, and while he was on his knees praising Jesus, he was caught in the hellfire of a former dragon best friend. Special thanks to the viewers in chat for confirming this. Just like Alterac, this critter trolled my perfect zero enemy kill score. Having said that, the pig was a former dragon, so I count that as them killing themselves. With white disabled, red not turned on because of the cliffs and heroes, I can just prepare for black. Black builds a lot and hangs out in the base, striking with dragons until a certain point where they just go mental. I need a preemptive strike them. Heading to the west, I start blizzard baiting and the naughty guys break in. Black falls easily after this and now he can relax without the threat of a goddamn dragon popping out every 10 seconds. Now to finish the war song. Looks like they have one death knight, so easy exorcism target. With the mass cast tech, I can nuke this guy super quick. Boom. Dead. Easy peasy and fuck! I forgot that Red still sends death knights occasionally and they got stuck on the cliff wall thinking they could reach my base. Time to re-kill Black. Okay, Death Knight's dead, War Song falling, it's time to bring in the big guns. Navy leads the way. Call it destiny, but it is funny that the Navy being a commonly brushed over part of this game and being my career is what saved this Deathless run on the last level. Goddamn sapper cliff starts. With the oil, you have just enough for one transport, so I ferry the gang over. Cadgar is the only one who could damage the portal. All other units do nothing. So get attacking and get comfy. You can tell this is supposed to be like a last stand defense, protecting Cadgar from waves of orcs while he blows it up. In modern Blizzard, Cadgar wouldn't be controllable and would be channeling for 40 minutes while waves of orcs spawn endlessly off map to attack you. Since we got some time to kill, I think it calls for a party. Let's have every unit from every race represented at the big Beyond the Dark Portal bash. Gnomes, elves, dwarves, men, unite! With this party kicking into full gear, we tear down the portal. With the portal gone, the planet tears itself apart while Cadgar and the gang are left behind. Lost to time and space, until ashes of Outland at least. So yes, we did it. We beat beyond the dark portal humans with minimal AI breaking glitches and zero deaths. At least we got pork. On to the horror. That is the orc campaign. Orcs, 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 orcs. On to the orcs. The orc campaign is not just harder, but it is torturous. Typically, the orcs are beyond OP due to bloodlust and blood hasted dragons, but the humans in this campaign are absolutely fucked. They crush you with exorcisms, polymorphs, so many griffins you want to exterminate anything with wings in real life. So, the orcs lost. The ones still on Azeroth have been rounded up into internment camps, and Ner'zhul, the new boss in charge, wants to open up more portals into more worlds. He will need some special artifacts, though. Common ones that you will see mentioned in future games. Gul'dan's skull gets passed around more than a joint at a high school party. First, we need to subjugate the lower clans. The orc heroes are a lot beefier than the humans, probably due to the lack of heals to sustain them. The only problem I have with this is you literally only get the heroes maybe once in the whole campaign until the last level, except for Terran Gorefiend, who due to being dead is a major liability for exorcisms. You don't even get Deathwing until the final mission, probably because he's so busted, but Grom shows up in the first mission, Korgath and Dentarg in the second, and that's it until the last one. 
the humans get Danny and Turalyon in like four or five missions, Alaria in two or three. So it's really weird, especially with the no build missions. The biggest no build mission in the orcs and an important one lore wise, you get no heroes. You even get one death knight here. Why not just make him Terran or give you Grom, which is one of the most important orcs in lore. Anyways, here we go. Level one, Slayer of the Shadow Moon. Just like the humans, we have a no build mission. We need to kill Mogor the Ogor. Yes, this Mogor the Ogor. A lot of this game gets retconned. We get Grom Hellscream here, and not the dour, brooding, but cool Grom from War 3. We get the shrill voiced, blood crazed, violent, badass Grom. He is so fucking stoked to be here, and either has horrible gingivitis or is currently drooling the blood of his enemies. This mission is basic, except for the end. We have to deal with three Death Knights with full mana. Gotcha DKs that you cannot see until it's too late. You gotta form up and lure out most of the enemies, and then when you are near the DKs, you gotta move in with healthy ogres and Grom himself at one point and tank death coils. It takes a couple tries, but once they are dry, get in there with trolls and kill them. Blow up the Temple of the Damned to move on. Level 2, the Skull of Gul'dan. The Skull of Gul'dan is in the hands of the Bone Chewer clan, whose chieftain is wearing it as a hat. The Bone Chewers in this game are a lot like the Savage Orcs in Warhammer Fantasy. Feral beasts wearing the bones of fallen enemies as armor and using their femurs as clubs. We need to get it. And we get the other two big daddy tanks in this level. My personal favorite orc hero, Korgath Bladesfist, and Dentarg, the ogre who kind of just disappears from history after this game. He has two heads here, while in the book he has one, and Khadgar just kills him at the end of the game and he's gone. Even Cho'Gal, who arguably had less screen time in Ties of Darkness, got retconned. So, we find Korgo and rescue the Thunderlord Purple Clan to the south. This level is super straightforward. The Bone Chewers are quite weak, but they are hyper aggressive. They will send a near constant line of grunts and trolls against your defenses, but that's it. They never tech up. Just build up the Death Knights and Ogre Mages and Lust and Death. The enemy defenses will fall and then move in and wipe them out. Level 3, Thunderlord and Bone Chewers. Three mirror matches in a row. Looks like the Bone Chewers and Thunderlords don't actually have the balls to come with us to Azeroth, so we need to smack them around a bit. You start in the middle of the map with barely anything but some scout towers. Get guard towers up fast. The enemy will start rushing soon and it will be slow to tech up. Other than that, this is a very straightforward mission. Just tech up to Blood Knights and wipe out the bad men. The Bone Chewers are to the south and the Thunderlords to the north. You just gotta be careful about scatter patrols after the bases fall. Easy peasy. Level 4, The Rift Awakened. We are through the portal and back into Azeroth. Say goodbye to Draenor, we will never see this tile set again. This is the opposite end of the human mission where we need to destroy the fortress of Netherguard so our reinforcements can come in through the portal. This is a stickler of a level, but has multiple strats that could work. Typically, I would just grind away at blue and take Netherguard right away, but the game eludes you to attack Teal first by starting your Zeppelin camera there. So that's where we're headed. Blue is far too fortified. Going green first also opens up rushing purple. Purple actually starts like a skirmish AI, one peasant and a town hall, so he won't have anything for a while. After we blow up green, we head to purple and knock them out, but blue, the clever girls they are, try to save their allies and catch me off guard. Attempt number two goes much better. We wipe out teal and purple and start fortifying. Blue doesn't send anything too nuts, but they do tech up after a while. Their lumber industry is outside of their fortress, so we can camp and kill them to slow them down. Once you have the essentials, we can start picking away at the dozens of towers guarding the walls. Other than that, blue doesn't do a whole lot for a while. They rely on their defenses to make them a challenge. We cut it close a few cannon tower snipes and then finish off the castle to take the win. And before Danny gets here. Level 5, the Dragons of Black Rock Spire. This is a really interesting level. We need to rescue the dragons from the second war to join us in the evasion. This is a small but tough map. Blue has guards everywhere and purple just likes being wieners and throwing griffins at you. 
Now this level is unique in that you can beat this mission almost with your starting force if you get some really lucky movement. But get a couple ogres and some armor if you really want to be safe. Get haste and unholy armor and you can blitz the end. So you don't actually need to kill anything in this mission. You simply need to touch the dragons and their roost near the end. I said before this map is small and you will see just outside your base is a sea of human. To the right of your starting position is the blue base through some narrow mountain passes but it is guarded by a bunch of knights who seem to be way more tanky than when I use them. Casually with deaths it is actually quite easy to beat the blue player right here and now. They have almost all of their farms in the south part of the map unguarded and with dozens of units they have scattered throughout the map it is very possible to just disable their economy here. This takes some work. To avoid save and load glitches, I restart when I fuck up, which takes its toll. I have to be precise here, the enemies are aggressive and I need to get building at home too because purple isn't just going to wait around for me to kill his buddy and will come with two griffins at a time. The problem with this and the next few levels is you start with so little economy and since my units can't die, I'm almost always supply blocked. I manage to find a sweet spot here and can chip away at enemy peasants and their farms but I get beaten by the 90s pathfinding. Oh my god! This pathfinding in the AI just drives me nuts sometimes. I tell these guys to move here and one dingus decides to go the opposite way directly through the enemy town and that forces a restart. Four towers. Upgrade them at the same time and boom. They pick away at the lumber mill and blacksmith forcing repairs. With this the enemy leash range constantly forces charges and retreats allowing free hits until it finally happens. I crack the defenses and blue is out. Purple is still being a pain, but it looks like they beeline to my base more so than wandering. I get some ogres and make a run for it, with haste and unholy armor, and do it! But I miss a dragon, and one dies, so I decide to just bloodlust the enemy, and man, blood ogres versus unupgraded humies is just hilarious. You'll be hearing the human death rattle a lot here. Once the coast is clear, tap on those dragons, and that's it. Five missions done, holy moly. Level 6, New Stormwind. Okay, things have been honky dory so far. Haha, <laughs> having a great time, watching the prices right, having a catch with dad, who never left for cigarettes, until New Stormwind. Remember my orc video when I said the capital city of Lordaeron didn't really feel like a city? No walls or nuances or anything? Well, New Stormwind decided to make up for that. This mission almost gave me an aneurysm. This mission, I swear, nearly broke me and I was about to give up on the whole run. We need the Book of Medivh, so have to siege Stormwind, which has since gotten some updates since we raised it in Warcraft 1. We start in the bottom right with Fuck All and Terran Gorfiend. The enemy has a gigantic walled city to the northwest, fully built and teched, and the cool Terran navy has a griffin factory behind some cliff walls to the west. The navy has an air force behind cliffs. Whatever. No sappers allowed, so we ain't breaking through here. The enemy is absolutely relentless here. They send griffins with minutes, and blue will send a near constant stream of troops in your direction, and they upgrade quick, like level 7 rangers and level 8 paladins in less than 10 minutes, and eventually fuck off mages. You have three natural walls into your base though, so I can wall up with a barracks and farms and towers. But to what end? The enemy gold mines are loaded too, like 200k each. Mine has less than 80k, so we'll run out really quickly, and the closest expansion is in the complete open. I cannot emphasize how tough this was. I tried turtling. Mages blew me up. I tried aggressive turtling, and they exercised Terran Gorfine. Terran also decided to just be the worst death knight here. Sometimes your death coil just fails, and you lose the mana. This legit pissed me off so bad. It was like so unclear why or how it fails, but it was just like RNG. I feel like I'm playing Baldur's Gate 3 here and I'm missing with the same ogre with my axe over and over. I also try avoiding the save and load glitch. I want to try my best to beat this game as pure as I can, but this is insanity. I notice to the right of Blue's base is where they cut most of their lumber. I wonder if I can rush up here and tower it up and snipe their peasants. As soon as I get here though, I get microed by ballistas. Legit, these fuckers space themselves out perfectly and snipe my dudes. Reset. 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 After three hours, something happens. I make it north and I get a couple towers up. T 
Teal kind of forgot about Euron's forces and take a break, and I get into position. But then the mages turn up. They start polymorphing, blizzarding, fireballing my shit, and I finally decide to use my one save and load. This clearly broke the AI. Blue ceases everything. But I still get greedy and get sniped. So I load again, and boom, the AI is back on. They build a griffin aviary area. Like we need more of those feathered fucks. They get exercise too, and makes my life really hard. I decide to go dragons. I make a dragon strike team alpha and blood haste them to strike at key targets. A tower here, a tower there. I start flaming their gold mine. Their peasants start panic repairing and all die. This stunts their economy so hard. I finally make some headway and blow up all their towers. I even make some catapults to finish off the rest. Blue is finally dead. Their church is gone, my dragon's well fed. Cleaning up teal is easy, and once the humans are all dead, the ending procs and zero kills for them. Oh my god, that was grueling. Three and a half hours later, and I'm officially halfway through the campaign. At least the three hour mission in Warcraft 1 was the finale. I wonder if this mission was over tweaked because the next mission is a cakewalk in comparison. Level 7 The Seas of Azeroth. We have to strike the cool Tyran navy again, this time with actual ship and more air forces. Big water map, probably the biggest water map, but ironically, the enemy doesn't make any ships. The cool Tyran navy makes no ships. Fine, whatever. You start on an island and need to kill some blue dinglings down south. These guys attack constantly but never progress past tier 2, so it's a matter of walling up and tacking out. The teal griffins come poking, but there's only one aviary, so they're not nearly as bad. Get blood ogres and death knights and clean up blue. Now I send a dragon strike force alpha into teal's tiny base and snipe their aviary. Once that is down, you just need to kill the ships. I run out of gold on my primary island, so need to expand. Normally, you'd have to expand to this first island, but the enemy has a massive force with loads of towers here, so I decide to ninja expand into the enemy's former home. I get a shipyard into this tiny cove, which should be safe, and move out with a transport. There is one spot at the top of this island that I can land Carl. Carl of Clan Lurak. I run him down and oh my god, his ass, his poor ass. We have a gold mine. The transport is sent home and with the last buildings dead, the enemy hoards all their ships to my expansion, which I wasn't prepared for. An oh so satisfying death and decay. And no, oh, Carl, Carl the Death Knight gets sniped by a battleship. Reload and the AI breaks frustratingly. This time their aggro fails and they just sit there and let me kill them. I am forced to make ships and go hunting. This goes fine enough. It's easy to micro ships and wreck them. The pain in the ass part is hunting the subs. Since the AI broke, they just hang out where they are, so I have to send dragons, zeppelins, anywhere I can to in order to spot these guys. I finally spot them and snipe them. Still, took a while, but way less effort required in order to finish this level. This was a weird difficulty curve from the previous mission. It took a huge dip. Level 8, Assault on Cool Terras. Man, Cool Terras has had more screen time than Azeroth or Motor on itself. After destroying the navy, we need to destroy the navy. This is another big one. Big, giant city. Bigger than Stormwind and Lordaeron. And more dick-ass griffins hidden behind cliffs. You start on a thankfully large island with a massive fleet of ships. You need to act fast because the enemy has a lot of ships too and send them in your direction in waves. And the Dick birds come with a vengeance here too. Casually, you have enough ships to knock out the enemy and their shipyard right away. Then you scuttle your own ships and move on. We are going to try this deathless, which brings me to the hardest part of this campaign, keeping your ships alive. Griffins will be flying around randomly and picking away at my ships, and there isn't a very good place to hide them. The biggest threat here is not the griffins though. It's not the navy, or the paladins, or the mages. The biggest threat here is, that's right, gnomish flying machines. We will get to these guys later. I never thought I'd have a problem with helicopters, but let's move on. It takes a few tries, but I managed to nail the navy. Time to send my transports and start building. 
Strangely, this griffin here is obsessed with killing this particular zeppelin. You don't see this often. He will hunt this fucking thing down until the end of time. I am cleaning up the shipyard and I hear something. Sinking ships? Somewhere? Ugh. They have a fucking submarine camp near my shoreline. The sneaky, sneaky gits. So, I blow up the navy again and then I colonize. Build up some stuff, but I got a massive supply block problem. I build a tower here and move some trolls over and notice the enemy are hyper focused on this tower for some reason. They ignore my trolls and catapults and I'm not complaining. This is without saving and loading mind you. I have restarted the mission every fail. I need to tech up and kill the goddamn aviaries. These griffins are going to haunt my fucking grave. I keep an eye on paladins and mages to see their levels. It won't be long until mages start coming to ruin my fucking day. Exorcisms won't be fun either. Everything is going smoothly until I hear something again. A ship sinking? Remember way long ago, back in a time far, far away when I said flying machines would be my downfall? Well, I guessed it long before it happened at that the helos would kill me. They cannot attack, but destroyers hate this one trick. This is a cheese I use casually, flying zeppelins over subs and watching as their destroyers kill each other. Destroyer cannons splash on air units to anything below. That's like a vertical ion beam of a cannon explosion. All of my ships are so weak from the beginning that one of my destroyers shot at the helo and killed his friend. I lost this run with friendly fire. This one really pissed me off. It wasn't even me. It was my dumb fuck asshole units that killed themselves. They're constantly disobeying orders and running the long way around, or in this case, shooting each other. Well, time to go again. This time, we try a crazy strat. I was challenged to rush my solo dragon straight into the griffin nest and ignore the navy. This, I've never tried before, because it's probably impossible. But hey, I'm at my wit's end, so let's go for it. I fend off the initial ship attacks and then move my dragon to the left. Hugging the wall, I move him up, only to be intercepted by a griffin with the same idea. Let's try that again. This time, I scout ahead, and man, this griffin is like a clairvoyant. He seems to know my plan. Well, I deke him out and head north and start shooting the aviaries. I fully expect a griffin to come home or at least be trained, so we'll leave this feller here for a while. Time to build up and resume my defense that seemed flawless before and periodically check on Pickles the dragon. I spread my ships out this time far enough that hopefully they cannot hit each other and get to work. I check back on Pickles, and it looks like he's doing okay. I don't want to jinx it, but he knocks down one aviary. That'll make things so much easier, but I'm also flabbergasted that he hasn't been intercepted. I watch slowly as each shot gets more and more intense, until... Bam! He did it! He blew up both aviaries. Pickles, you're going home! I send him home, and of course he veers off course, and his second guard tower hits him. If this fucking guy dies now, I'm just uninstalling this game. By the grace of Gork, or oh, Mork, and for Doomhammer, Pickles makes it back to base. Princesses and gold for Pickles! I sit him on my gold mine to brood and let him enjoy his retirement. He earned it. That's a good boy, Pickles. Wouldn't that be a neat feature? Dragons regen while in proximity of a gold mine? <laughs> just a random thought. It looks like all the flying machines have been sniped too. Thank fucking God. You don't understand until it's gone how awesome it is to not have to deal with friggin' two griffins harassing every molecule of your forces constantly. My next target is the Mage Tower. While testing, it seems the enemy does not rebuild tech structures, which is odd, but meh, I ain't complaining. I take up the dragons and get a strike team alpha. Blood haste them and to strike some key targets. Towers down. And next is the mage tower. I crush the tower and kill both mages. And now I'm chilling. It looks like the enemy does not research exorcism here, which I wonder why. Maybe the devs realized how fucking annoying it was two missions ago, so they're giving me a break. Right now, the enemy is as good as dead. They send lackluster waves of units and just die on my walls. As far as I'm concerned, the enemy is defeated. So I save and use this as my load checkpoint. I expand to this little forested area to wall off. Things are looking good. Gather my forces and Carl, 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 no, no. Wow, wow, wow. 
The enemy rangers with plus one range actually sniped my dumbass peons, who for some reason started chopping wood instead of mining, and fuck, that's a reset. Right, the enemy has one mage left, so it's not over yet. I death and decay an ogre mage through the outskirts, kill the mage, and obliterate the gold mine. This is satisfying. Now we just clean up. This was a cool outcome. No save and low glitch, and we killed the griffin aviaries and the mage tower almost immediately. What an awesome outcome to this match. This is Strategy Gaming. Level 9, the Tomb of Sargeros. The last no-build mission. We need the Scepter of Sargeros from the tombs that Gul'dan raised in the vanilla game. I forgot that we come back here, and the Night Hills come back here too, so this is a level where you'd think you'd get a hero unit. At the very least, Terran or Dentarg or something, but nah, just a little squad. This is a weird level. We're here to get the Scepter from a bunch of demons, and the undead remains of the Twilight's Hammer and the Storm Reavers are here, to bar our way. But there's also humans? They're working together here too. And there's some random ass bone chewers in this world, bleeding hollow, orcs, rescuables about. Re rescue this harbor and build a transport. Rescue this temple of the damned and research DD, not skellies. Skellies die and it will be useless. Rescue these hidden trolls and these orcs from this prison. I decide to use my DK to scout over these cliffs and instantly get nuked by exorcism. That's right, these guys have exorcism. I manage to D&D into the blackness and kill the beach defenders and move in with this large force. Rescue this catapult and blacksmith, buy some upgrades and ooh, mages! This is a gotcha level to the core. Every few inches some other holy shit moment strikes out of nowhere. Three towers behind this wall, so snipe with catapults and oh shit, gotcha ballista! Gotcha bitch! Saving and loading doesn't matter in this level, so I spam it. Upgrade the catapult damage to hopefully get some one-shots on mages or pallies, and before you know it, some jacked-up demon comes by. This guy has inflated stats, but still sucks, so kill him and the mission ends. Level 10, Alterac. Well, well, back to the traitor's lands of Alterac. These guys still haven't learned their lessons, and are still traitors. So it looks like the Book of Medivh, which we were supposed to capture in New Stormwind, was already stolen by Alterac spies, and they want to broker a deal. This means that that three and a half hour mission was fucking pointless. But this also means we need to find a spy mage at his house in the southeast corner of this land and bring him to your circle of power. You get some human knights here. It's kind of nice hearing human voice lines again. You have two nasty enemy bases to deal with here, Stromgar to the east, behind lots of walls and loader on to the south. More exposed, but a lot of shit spread out. These guys get real nasty if you let them build up, so we need to kill them fast. During a casual playthrough, I found a pretty foolproof way to win this mission in five minutes. Well, defeat the enemies in five minutes, the rest of the mission is just clean up and escort. You have to kill every unit on this map. So, there are some cool Terran guards randomly in these mountains, but you start with seven knights and an ogre, so just roll them over. Once the coast is clear, take your three dragons, this is really generous, and move them horizontally across this field. You will see the walls of Stromgard are thick and defended, except by the south. Mine this tower and you will see that there are no guards here, in the bottom of the base, and a handful of archers come to defend. Blast them, and we have free reign over their town hall. Neither enemies start with lumber in this map, so you will shoot this town hall from this angle, Peasants will repair from behind it, which means they will get caught in the splash zone and die. That's it. Red is dead. Now for Lordaeron. Follow the path your dragons took and move south to the back of the white space. It is very vulnerable here too. There is one guard tower you got a power kill and a couple rando troops and a scary ballista who almost nuked my ogre. Cat and mouse the archers and that's it. These bottom three bricks on the grid allow you to smash away at their town hall with impunity. They have no lumber, so they will send dudes to harvest south, so you can just intercept them, and that's it. Both enemies are disabled and technically dead in less than five minutes. Now just build a base, tech up, and usual clean up the enemies. D&D &D the three destroyers in the river and send them across. Kill the squad of footmen and rescue the mage. Bring them home for the win. And that's it. First try this mission. 
This mission was very scary as a kid, and even the chat was keen to see my genius smooth brain tactics. This was a really fun one. Level 11, the Eye of Dalaran. Let's -a go. This was the mission I was most worried about for when I conceived this run idea, and it definitely didn't disappoint. This mission was a major pain. We have almost everything we need to build more portals, but we need the Eye of Dalaran, which is currently in the newly rebuilt Cross Island, which is a lot smaller this time around. It's the one and only instance of snow in this whole game too. It has my favorite things. Under immediate fire start, millions of griffins, and a land enemy that gets super stupid if left alive. That means mages, that means paladins, all the fixings. The same strategy applies to most of the other missions. We need to rush the enemy, in particular, purple. I have a plan for this. Purple actually doesn't start with barely anything. They have all their farms enclosed in a pretty unguarded prison of walls to the far southeast. And due to them having a fuck ton of dudes guarding the Violet City, they are very prone to getting supply blocked and disabled. White is the other problem. They have two griffin aviaries in the top and bottom of the map, and these bastards pump griffins non-stop. They start with 50k gold and lumber too, but don't make peasants, so expect to see a lot of them. We start like a bunch of other maps, on an island under fire by a fleet of enemy ships. The enemy ships seem to high roll their damage too, because they consistently one-shot my destroyers. A griffin turns up here too. You start with a good amount of boats and three dragons, which is handy, but your island is small and the enemy ships can fire on your units. It takes me a long time to finally break this initial assault. Now, I have two choices fly my dragons all the way south to strike at the bottom aviary and then proceed to hit purple. This worked in practice. During the stream, my god, white was on top of things. This aviary seemed to have build speed hacks because this thing pumps out three griffins by the time I get it to critical health. There's even a starting griffin that holds position here. And even one time a bunch of archers show up randomly. I cannot break this. I try over and over but it just isn't in the RNG. I decide to focus north instead. Establishing a beachhead and putting up a few towers to hold a line while I move my dragons into position. You can hit this northern aviary with your catapults, which was my initial plan, while I destroy the southern one with dragons, but I'm running out of time. I fly my dragons, nuke it, fly this path to the east and south to reach Purple's farms. Like I said before, the key is to not waste their resources, it's to kill enough peasants and farms to prevent Purple from being able to train more peasants. This takes a few tries to and not reloading in between tries starts to take its toll on my psyche. These griffins are cracked too, man. They seem to know exactly where I am and where the weak units are. One even flies past my defenses to snipe my one health destroyer when I'm not looking, and they usually intercept my dragons to save purple. For some reason too, they get obsessed with killing zeppelins, which is such bizarre behavior. I finally get some leeway and burn a couple farms, using the splash damage to kill some peasants. A white griffin appears, but with some micro, I nail him, and it looks like purple is down for the count. It still isn't over yet, though. White has a lot of standing forces and still likes to attack ground troops. I take this opportunity to save and use this as a checkpoint. I could give a fuck about the AI glitch at this point, and white doesn't build, so his AI doesn't break. I strike the northern area. No towers, and most of white's farms are here. Nuke these farms, and boom. White's dead, and no more goddamn griffins. The rest is cleanup. Tech up to Death Knights and Ogres and just kill the towers and blow up purple. Move north and I try to mass cast whirlwinds, which actually looks pretty cool and works out not too bad. I also experiment and discover that you can use the mass spell technique with unloading transports too. Too bad heal and bloodlust weren't AoE spells. Slowly DD the rest of purple and we're finally done. Three and a half hours later. This was a grueling one, and hilariously, I said I was not too worried about the next mission. Foreshadowing. Level 12, the Dark Portal. Big time last mission. Lots of jacked up enemies, lots of griffin, lots of pain. We start with a large force and all the heroes, including Big Daddy Pickles, Deathwing. I think they avoided giving you Deathwing ever because he is busted as fuck. The key to this mission is Deathwing has time to disable one enemy with speed and positioning, at least at my skill level. So, we got purple, Dalaran. Starts medium, but ramps up hard. Makes mages and griffins. Green. Cool Taras, again. Who starts hard, but only ever trains tier 1. White. Lordaeron, who goes nuts really fast with all tech. And blue. 
Azeroth, who literally makes everything but never leaves his island bases, so he resorts to dirty-ass griffins. So what do we do? Disable blue to stop griffins? Disable purple to stop ramp? Or to stop white to prevent an endless horde of mages and pallies? I experimented off-stream the pros and cons of each, and it seemed to me white has got to go. Griffins are a major pain, but once I can get a foothold, I can handle them. I cannot fight on three fronts. Purple is my base target. It will give me a lot of resources on only one gate. Green has a lot in the way, though. Now, I'm going to skip past a few tries here, because the start took me a long time to get. The problem with this mission is I was losing to my own units more so than the enemy. Yes, the enemy surprised flanks and snipes with ballistas, but man, managing all these units while under attack on three fronts is such a pain. These idiots constantly disobey orders or go around the long way to get shot or hit each other. I'm looking at you, catapults. So first things first, Deathwing. Blood haste him and send him south ASAP. He is a massive tank with 800 health and 10 armor. The key is to snipe this tower and position him level with this castle on the left. Doing this will disable white for the rest of the map. He will waste all his peasants on repairing the castle and Deathwing will eventually whittle him down. Once the castle goes down, white is dead. If white gets to a stage where he starts building more towers, it's too late. After an hour and a half of dancing with green, building towers to protect my peons and luring purple, we finally break through. I bring up Deathwing to snipe this one aviary. Blue has two island bases. The north one has no peasant production and is their primary lumber reserve. It also has a mage tower, a barracks, and its aviary. I look away for a second and realize Deathwing can't outkill these archers. The spam is too annoying and his attack priorities are on the knights instead. I have to put him to bed, which makes things way harder. He was my primary strike team. Pull him out, haste him bloodlust, and send him in. So this will slow me down. The AI leash range is infuriating here. He seems to bail on fighting within feet of his own town hall, which drags my dinguses out to get sniped by towers. Finally, wipe out Purple's barracks and towers and build up. Green will constantly attack with squads, but a few towers at the entrance and he will just wash up against them. I build all of the towers here. The only threat now is Griffins. I construct a perimeter of towers and slowly start picking away at Green. This guy is still no joke though, he spams units pretty hard. Once his barracks go down though, it's GG. I use my heroes as much as I can here. Bloodlusted Grom and Korgoth are so good. Apart from Griffins, a big threat is also random towers. They are everywhere and it is really easy to be sniped off camera. Take no risks, just slowly D&D &D and scout ahead. I nearly get ended by this ballista, but luckily it goes okay. Once white is cleared out, I can start stealing their gold. I then proceed to make Dragon Strike Team Alpha. I use them to clear out the Northern Blue base, which fucks with them good. They are still, however, fairly adamant of ships, sucking up all the precious oil. I D&D &D this oil platform dozens of times, sinking dozens of ships and costing them a lot of money, but they do not relent. Now comes a series of fuck-ups. I make too big of a Dragon Strike Team. I manage to kill this last aviary, but the dragons hit each other more than the enemy. I also forgot to haste one dragon, so when I nail these towers and pull them out, of course he's the one that stays behind and gets killed. Then out of nowhere, this asshole decides to do his own thing and go off into the enemy base. I do another strike and pull out with a dragon at low health, and he's dead. Look here. Look at this. Look at this shit here. There was a farm on fire, and my other dragons were so mad they decided to blow it up, not giving a fuck if it killed their best friend and sibling. This is what I'm talking about here. I was doing great, no saves or loads until this last part where my reet ass units started making shit up and getting killed. I was actually getting proper annoyed here. Blue also makes rangers here, and legit these guys are no joke. They easily DPS my dragons, so I do another strike team and blow them up. Killing the lumber mill also prevents them from retraining. You also have to be wary about random enemy destroyers too, these guys are dragon killers. Before destroying the rest of blue, we need to take care of one last griffin. That's right, Kurdrin and Skyri is here, and if all buildings go down, he goes ape. So, I make Dragon Strike Team Alpha and Dragon Strike Team Bravo. One for Kurdrin and one for Alaria. Alaria is nasty here. I fly in and nuke him with one dragon almost dead. I take out Khadgar too to be safe. Luckily, human mages don't do anything to air units unlike Death Knights. Here we go. Everything is destroyed, all the enemies are dead except for the remaining human heroes guarding the portal. 
I decide to go mono e mono here. Orc heroes versus humans. Bloodlust, Korgoth, and Grom, and it's not even fair. They dummy these fools easily. I then decide to insult their memory by raising their corpses as skellies. I didn't realize that you can't raise knights until their horses rot, so I got Turalyn raised just as the victory screen popped. Alright, moment of truth. Did we do it? No sheep, no hellbores, no sappers, and... Boom! Zero deaths and 406 kills, which has to be the most I've gotten in either campaign yet. And man, it feels good. So there we have it. Over 30 hours of grueling torture, but we did it. No ifs, ants, or buts. With only one critter killed, who was a former dragon, so that means it was an enemy, we can definitely say, yes, you can beat Warcraft 2, Beyond the Dark Portal, Orcs and Humans, Deathless. Thanks again for all the support. This community is so awesome, it actually makes me want to stream. You all know who you are. Thanks and see you on the next one.